Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're beginning a study in the Gospel of John, verse by verse. I'm not going to spend any time whatsoever on the, the so-called higher critical examination of the book. The author, as I've stated in previous verse by verse series, is the Holy Spirit. There's tons of, uh, of articles of studies dedicated to finding out who wrote this book. And, you know, none of which really is of any spiritual value to us. None of it will give you peace. None of it will give you uh, peace, rest, and joy in Christ. This is the Word of God. The author is the Holy Spirit. And I believe without question the Holy Spirit used John the Apostle to pen these words. There was a, a close association between John and our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everybody knows that John was the Apostle that Jesus loved. But John was the younger son of Zebedee and Salome, who happened to be uh, the sister of Mary, the Virgin Mary. So John was very, very close to Jesus of Nazareth. John's older brother was James, who, uh, interestingly enough, was the first martyr for his faith and trust in Christ. And John, the younger brother, was the last martyr for his faith and trust in Christ. There are uh, four Gospels, and I believe that the four Gospels are an integrated whole by the Holy Spirit to present to us a beautiful picture of Christ. Everybody seems to know that Matthew was primarily used by the Holy Spirit to, to present the kingship of, of Christ. Uh, Luke to present uh, his humanity, his position as man, uh, not just God, a very God, but, but, but man, fully man, fully human. Uh, Mark as servant and John as God. Others have suggested that Matthew was written to the Jew, that Mark was written to the Romans, and that Luke was written to the Gentiles, and John was written to Christians. I believe it's the purpose of the Holy Spirit to give us a fourfold revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we begin our study in this amazing gospel, which, by the way, I don't expect to ever now leave or get out of until the Lord comes. Could be wrong about that, but I doubt it. I, I was sitting around last night thinking about how long would it take me to get through the Gospel of John if I did one video a week. And I thought it would take about seven years. If I do two videos a week, you're looking at three and a half years. That's quite some time quite a lengthy time to stay in 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 one verse by verse series but uh, there's quite a lot to the gospel of john i did this uh, really i uh, it got it was a request by a viewer that got me to thinking about uh, going into the gospel of john and i was i have to admit i was hesitant about that i didn't know if i really wanted to commit myself to that or not once I put my hand to the plow, there's no turning back. So as we begin our study in the Gospel of John, we read the most beautiful, the, mo the most simplest, the most profound Greek in all of the New Testament. In fact, there's such a dramatic difference between the Greek of the Gospel of John and the Greek of the book of Revelation that, that many have suggested that John really couldn't have written both. And again, I want to point out to you the fact that 
the author is the Holy Spirit. John simply held the pen. John is simply the servant that the Holy Spirit used to give us these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, I find it interesting that in the Word of God, the most profound pronouncements are usually made with the simplest of language, uh, the simplest of terms. Everybody without question has noticed the great similarity between the Gospel of John chapter one, verse one, and Genesis chapter one, verse one. In your authorized version, you, you read in Genesis, in the beginning, God. In John here, you read, in the beginning was the Word, and in neither case is the Word, uh, is the Word articulated. You could translate that at the first or in the beginning, and it's the same here in the Gospel of John. It's the same Greek construction that we have in the Hebrew of Genesis 1-1. In beginning. There is no uh, the or definite article there. At the first was the word. Now th there's an English word. There's the, the English word was and that occurs several times in this first paragraph. However, it's the trans translation of, of two very different Greek words. This is the Greek word uh, the, the root word to be, uh, uh, it's the, the word translated I am when the, uh, the, the Lord Jesus said in chapter 8, before Abraham and Isaac uh, were I am, or literally before Abraham and Isaac became I am. In this first paragraph, it's in the imperfect tense. Uh, so without any question, the Greek is saying that before anything was, there was God. Now, there's a, many of you know this, there's a fundamental principle in physics, uh, a very fundamental principle, and that is that, that, that out of nothing comes nothing, that nothing can spawn nothing, and, you know, to suggest in any way that there was a time when, the, when there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was something, you know, is really academic foolishness. That's why many scientists, I believe, refuse to go back before that point in uh, time, quote unquote, you know, when all matter, uh, no matter existed all matter did not exist, but was in fact energy of, of, of immense concentration, you know, and, and of a very condensed or a very uh, small proportion. And then we had a so-called Big Bang, and, then, and when one probes where this energy came from, or, or what was there before time began, it's a question that's it's almost universally ignored. 
the Greek, folks, is declaring that the word was eternal. In our previous videos, I addressed some of the issues that surround this concept of man's uh, free will, the question of man's free will. I hear ministers say, well, you know, if someone could be born and they lived their, their whole life, their entire life, and then they never committed a sin of any kind, well, then they could go into heaven and they could tell God just to move over because there's now two of us. Absolutely not. To build such a straw man, you know, is that, it, it's, it's just foolishness. Because, you know, for one who is born to never commit one single sin, well, so, such a person would have to be eternal. You know, uh, I, would, I, would, I would ask, well, is he omniscient? No. Is he omnipotent? No. Is he uh, intrinsically righteous? No. If the Word is eternal, the Word is God. It's the height of Greek ignorance to suggest that we could translate this in be in beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was a god that's the translation of the jehovah witnesses you know uh new testament you know, when they come knocking at your door but but it, it is not valid greek exegesis you've destroyed the intrinsic meaning of the statement if you substitute an indefinite article you have it in first john the god is love so to suggest that, that you know you ought to translate that the god is a love well you know which by the way the the uh, strangely or incidentally the the jehovah witnesses they don't do that you know why would they put the a in here and not there that's not what the greek is saying it is first of all saying that the word is eternal and the was there which is the the root greek word to be is in the imperfect tense there is no completion in the imperfect tense it's the only tense that could be used to say that that he always was the problem with the human mind is that we're we are severely hemmed in by time the word is eternal he never did start and for us in our our human limitations to comprehend something that is eternal is extremely difficult i've had people say you know you don't seem to understand that the greek mind had no comprehension of eternity well i hey, i can do them one better than that the modern science uh, of today if 2020 has no comprehension of eternity the common thought regarding eternity is simply time piled on top of time, and that, folks, is not true. Eternity is not a, an extension of time. I think it was H.G. Wells who wrote that eternity is defined as a solid rock, a one-mile cube, and once every 10,000 years, this hummingbird, you know, he comes around to this rock, and he uses it to sharpen his beak, and when he's worn the rock away, well, the first day of eternity will have elapsed, will have passed. Nonsense. I don't know what H.G. Wells was trying to say, but that's not true. Eternity and time are totally separate concepts. I've spent some time discussing this both on YouTube and Facebook, especially as it relates to the death of the Christian, where he takes a journey out of time into eternity. And the clear statement here is that the Word is eternal. Jehovah declares He's the first and the last, and Christ declares He's the first and the last, so how can we not believe that Christ is Jehovah God? Before there was anything, there was the Word. At the first, in beginning, however you want to translate it, was the Word. It's an imperfect, and the Word was with God. If ever there is a place in all the Word of God where you appreciate prepositions, it's here. Isn't it wonderful that the Holy Spirit didn't say, and the Word was in God, uh, of God, uh, from God? It isn't ek, you know, out of. It isn't 
Epsilon nu in, it's pros. Okay, pros. The word pros there I mean, literally means toward. The word was face to face. God. In the beginning always was the word. And the word was face to face. God. And in, in case you don't understand that preposition, the Holy Spirit goes on and says, and the word was God. Now the Greek doesn't actually you know, say it that way. The Greek says God was the word and that's the way that we ought to understand it. We should not make it say something less than what the Greek says it is. If it said the word was the God and again the was, you know, we have we have three was's there. They're all imperfects of the Greek word to be. They're all the imperfect tense. If we were to say the word was the God, then we would be saying that all that God was was the word, and we'd have the same problem in First John. The God is love. If it if it said the God is the love then it would be saying that all that love is is God, and all that God is is love. Now, one of those statements is correct. All that love is is God. But the other statement is not correct. All that God is is love. Well, that's not true. Therefore, it is technically impossible for the Holy Spirit to put the second definite article there, and the same thing applies here. All that the Word is, is God. But all that God is, is not the Word. And suddenly, all of a sudden, we got a, a, a crystal clear pronouncement of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we look at the Word was God, or God was the Word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, He spoke, He said, let there be light. What was that? The Word of God. It's no wonder it won't be very long until we read that Jesus Christ, who is God of very God, created all things. In our studies uh, through Colossians, He was before all things, and by Him all things were made that are made, and through Him all things consist. God said, let there be light. There was. God spoke, and it happened. The Word is the manifestation of God, folks. Christ is said to be manifest in and through our lives. I'm going to say that again. The Word is the manifestation of God. Christ is said to be manifested in through our lives. What do we mean when we say God? Jesus Christ. The only manifestation I have, the only revelation I have of God is Jesus Christ. No man has seen the Father at any time, but it's the Son that has declared Him, who has revealed Him. The Word is the revelation of God. What I know about God, I know through His Word. And the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. That first verse is a very few Greek words, but profound in all that it says. That, that there never was nothing. There never was nothing. It's astounding that modern science could suggest to you that out of nothing comes something, and then out of that nothing not only comes something, but something that, you know, uh, uh, a spouse's morality and meaning and purpose and intention. If it came out of nothing, there's no meaning. There's no reason to be moral. There's no basis for hope. There's no design. There's no purpose. There's no uh, ultimate aim. It's no wonder so many people are ships without rudders or compass. There never was nothing. There always was God. And He always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Genesis 1, it was in the beginning God, and God said, let there be light, and His Spirit brooded upon the face of the waters. The word hovered there means to brood. 
There's uh, the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. And here we have the author, the Holy Spirit, with the profound statement that there never was nothing. It was always God. How do we accommodate that, okay, to our language? How do we understand the concept of eternity and an infinite eternal God? He always was. He was not only face to face God, but he was in fact God, a very God. All that the Word is, is God. God exists as three persons. We may not understand that, but the scriptures make it clear, absolutely clear, that He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But here is the clearest possible statement that our, our, the Lord Jesus Christ is God, a very God. That's why he thought it not robbery to be equal with God when he humbled himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and even becoming obedient unto death, and that the death of a cross. If you make the Lord Jesus Christ something less than God, folks, then you have to remove his eternality, okay? If you suggest that he was uh, another God and, and, and thereby eternal, well, you suddenly no longer, you're no longer a, a monotheist, you're a polytheist, and, and you have more than one God. You, you know, uh, you have two wills, you have two minds, two purposes, two intents, you know, and one less than the other. All things were made by Him, and for those of you who study the Greek, you'll find out that most of the time when you see the word all, panta, all things, it's articulated. The all things. The definite article is the, is the article of previous reference and definite identity. There's no article here. You might as well read this, that everything that was made was made by means of Him. If Jesus Christ created everything, was God, and spoke, and there was light, God spoke and the waters were, were separated from the dry land, all things were created by Him and for Him. You know, if you remember uh, back in Colossians chapter 1, by Him was not anything made that was made. All creation was the work of the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, separate from Him, there was absolutely not anything made that was made. Now we have a different Greek word for made. Uh, you'll notice this if you look at the original text. This one comes, you know, from Genemai. It's uh, Agoneto. All things were made by means of Him and without Him, uh, separate from Him, was not one single thing made that was in fact made. Those are aorist indicatives, by the way. They're really true, and it was done once. He's not recreating. He created. He spoke the worlds into existence. Uh, and whether he did that in, in an instant of time, you know, whether he did it in seven, seven, six days, rested on the seventh, or, or you know, uh, uh, long periods of time, is really only incidental to our present study. He did it. It was the Word. Uh, it was the author of all creation, as well as the author of our redemption, the author and finisher of our faith. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. We're going to find that the Gospel of John is not, uh, it's not replete with miracles like, you know, some of the other Gospels are. Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with only a few short periods of time of the earthly ministry of our Lord. And some deal with, with quite a few miracles. In the Gospel of John, we only have seven and they all are miracles used by the Holy Spirit to teach us profound spiritual truth. That, that truth is the life that we have in Christ. All seven uh, miracles are used to highlight the truth of our life in Christ, and it's in Him. No other way. Not by human works, not by strength, not by ability, not by race, not by... 
by family nor heritage but in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the light of men. There's no light separate from the Word of God. There's no truth separate from the Word of God. This is the basis of truth. Everything around you is slanted, you know, toward that which is false. It has behind it some, some uh, motive, politics, you know, money, something else that, that drives what uh, is portrayed or what pur purports to be the truth. The Word of God, folks, is truth. The Word of God is the light of men. If we're to receive light and, and understanding, purpose, and, it, uh, and meaning in our life, it's in this book. It's in the Word of God. That light continues to shine. It is a, uh, if you look for you Greek students, it continues to shine. It is a present indicative. Um, and verse 5, uh, verse 5 continues to shine in the darkness, but the darkness does not comprehend it, folks. Doesn't comprehend it. All of the previous videos that I've published on the, the so-called will of man is concentrated actually in this one statement. The darkness does not lay hold upon it. Think total depravity, folks. Does not comprehend it. Does not. The not is not the simple negative, but the absolute negative. It, the word there is, if you look at it in the Greek, the word is, is ou, uh, omicron, uh, upsilon. It absolutely cannot comprehend it. God is light. The word is the light of men. In him is no darkness at all, but there's darkness. And I believe that that darkness is a picture of sin the operation of Satan, the fall of man. And it's in that darkness that God moved to recreate. Just as the uh, recreation out of darkness occurred in Genesis 1, where it is said darkness covered the face of the deep. Hopefully you're starting to get a see the excitement that I I uh, experienced last night, staying up late looking at at our present study as compared to Genesis chapter one, the first few verses of Genesis Genesis chapter one. Amazing connection here. I'll try to explain this, and I hope that uh, you share with me in the same excitement it's not often that i kind of get rattled over uh something uh, like i did this this shook me to my core because what i saw folks is i saw that there is an inter interesting shadow we look at genesis and we sh we see the shadow okay of total depravity god saying let there be light Separating the light from the darkness. We were made new creations in Christ. I, I, I hope you're seeing this. I, I truly do. So our new birth, our new life out of darkness is in Jesus Christ. But listen, dearly beloved, the darkness absolutely does not comprehend it. Modern evangelism would suggest that you're in darkness. You're, you're without life without hope, you're headed for hell, but if you would do something, you could change that. And what they're, what they're suggesting, folks, is that your darkness can comprehend when God's Word says it cannot. It cannot. It does not. There has to be a work of God, and that's what we're going to see in our next study, John uh, Part 2 of this series. 
There is no way the flesh can please God. There's no way that the carnal mind can comprehend the truth of the Word of God. Absolutely no way, as they say, no way, Jose. There must be, first and foremost, a work of God. I believe that there was an original creation in which there was no darkness. And then Satan rebelled and God judged it. In popular circle, circles, uh, Christian circles, that's called the gap theory. And, uh, and so I believe the first creation was judged and out of that darkness, God recreated in six days. He remade a creation in which He works. Listen to me. Just like we were made a new creation in which He works. Are you getting this? Now, I believe that's a, a picture of our being made new, a new creation out of darkness, and God did it. The darkness didn't do it, folks. The darkness didn't comprehend it. God recreated, rebuilt out of the judgment or the darkness of Genesis chapter 1, and God has taken, He's taken us who are, who are without hope, without ability, totally depraved, and made us new creations in Christ Jesus, totally separate from our own will, our own desire, and our own choice. And if you look at back in Genesis, He separated the light from the darkness. We're not our old man. It's, it's just super, super exciting folks it really is folks set your affections on things above i love you all i truly do until next time this is steve thanks for watching